right, fantastic. Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining our uh, virtual expo forum today. Uh, you'll have to excuse the appearance a little bit. I got my, my gaming headset on here. I am actually living out of a suitcase in Boston. Uh, just completed a move from Las Vegas to Boston in the middle of COVID-19. Uh, don't recommend a cross-country move unless you got to do it. Uh, I'm starting a new school program uh, this fall. Uh, but anyways, day 14 out of 14 of the self-quarantine we had to do, so it's a, it's a good day for us. Uh, let's go ahead and start this presentation. Again, thanks for joining. So first of all, who am I? My name is Jay Minsmeyer. I cover the maritime shipping sector. I've been covering these firms for about 11 years uh, on the internet through uh, Seeking Alpha primarily. Uh, that's a place, a forum where folks can share their research and their trade ideas and whatnot. Uh, a little over five years ago, I launched an exclusive research platform called Value Investors Edge. Uh, we have around 500 members on that platform, and that's for folks to learn more about the shipping sector and other deep value areas and uh, share their own ideas. We have a chat room and exclusive research. We cover uh, 48 maritime shipping firms and so on. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Mincemeyer right there uh, for free updates. I, I tweet not a lot, but maybe uh, three or four times a week uh, if there's any uh, relevant uh, shipping news or anything like that. And if you're interested in the research after this presentation and want to learn more, uh, just go to Mincemeyer.com. It's right there. Uh, we have a two-week free trial open. We're in the middle of Q2 earnings coverage. Uh, check it out. Uh, see if it's something that, that makes sense for you and your portfolio. We have a wide range of folks on there, uh, anyone from sort of medium to high net worth retail, all the way up to hedge funds, family offices, and just in industry insiders who want to know the latest about shipping sectors. So the topic today, we're going to talk about COVID-19 recovery investing, a little bit of trading as well. And, you know, I believe there's an outsized return potential in maritime shipping. It's kind of been a laggard uh, these last few months. Uh, folks think COVID, right? They thought China, and hence a lot of shipping names got blown up uh, unfairly, in my opinion. Uh, but anyways, with that said, we're going to launch into it. I'm going to spend about 20 minutes is the goal on this presentation. And then we'll leave about 10 minutes on the back end for questions. And the way I understand it, the moderator is going to take the questions and feed those to me. And then if we have more questions than we have time, sometimes that happens, uh, feel free to hop over to Seeking Alpha and send me a message or even tweet at me on Twitter. And I'll make sure I answer your question today. I really appreciate you joining us. So today's topic, so we're going to talk a little bit about our research background at Value Investors Edge, how we do things, what our approach to the market is. And then we're going to talk about the COVID-19 impact to shipping stocks and, and what that has done uh, to the industry. And then finally, we're going to talk about the recovery trades and investment opportunities across five different segments of the market, container ships, dry bulk, LPG, LNG, and crude tankers. Each one of those, I'm going to give you a top a trade or investment idea in those categories and sort of a list of firms as well. I'll do as many disclosures as I can throughout this presentation. I am long a lot of these companies, so just keep that in mind. I am talking my own book, but I also eat my own cooking. Uh, finally, at the end, we'll spend about 10 minutes on Q&A. So first of all, our track record, we've been, I've been doing research for about 11 years, and we've been doing this more professionally on Value Investors Edge for five years now. We started in May of 2015. Uh, we focus on small cap stocks with little institutional coverage. The majority of the shipping companies, and keep this in mind, shipping, maritime shipping does 90% of global trade. So we're talking about significant infrastructure and, and moving pieces, but the stocks themselves aren't that big. Uh, the largest one we cover is a little bit over 2 billion market cap and the smallest ones around 50 or 60 million. So not penny stocks, but they're definitely smaller stocks and not a lot of coverage and, and a lot of weird volatility. Uh, inefficiencies and so on. We stay completely in our lane. I only cover maritime shipping. Uh, I also have a macro associate who covers all the overall macro pictures and as well as commodities. And then I also work with a gentleman, Michael Boyd, who covers energy and, and some income things around you know infrastructure and, and that sort of stuff domestically. So we all stay in our own lane. We're all experts at what we do. Uh, it, you know, someone asked me you know, a Tesla stock or Chipotle stock or something. Sure, you know, we want to have a beer and, and BS a little bit. We can talk about it, but that's not my business. I, I don't give any sort of investment ratings or advice on stuff that I don't understand completely. So when things are good in shipping, they are very good, right? So this is a review of 2019 uh, performance. Uh, 2019 was a good year for most shipping stocks. Uh, you can see on the on the bottom there, uh, the black line is the Russell 2000. That's our comp, our small cap comp. And then the purple uh, line there is, is the overall shipping sector. So you can see the shipping sector slightly outperformed the Russell. Nothing to really write home about. Meanwhile, with our model portfolios and our approach to the market, uh, we were able to outperform by about 20% with our best risk reward picks, and we were able to produce 102% return with our speculative picks. That was 2019. A chart for 2020 looks pretty ugly. We're not going to sugarcoat that. Uh, when things are good, they're good, and when they're bad, they're bad. And 2020 has been a rough year, and we're going to walk through that in these next couple, couple slides here. So COVID-19 just completely crushed shipping stocks. 
And you might think, oh, that makes sense because, you know, COVID-19 is going to destroy all these shipping lanes and hurt the rates and so on. But that's not actually what happened in most of the segments. In fact, most of the segments, tankers in particular, were posting record high profits. Uh, we'll also talk about some other sectors that are doing pretty darn well and, and not like the stocks would suggest. So first of all, every single shipping stock was destroyed in Q120. It didn't, re it didn't matter. Long-term contracts, solid balance sheet, good management. It didn't matter. Every single stock was crushed. There was... To make things worse, there was really no recovery trade in, in April to July. They're, the stocks have just flatlined. Nobody's interested in them. And meanwhile, the majority of the rates have been resilient, which is incredibly frustrating because, you know, if the companies were doing poorly, we would expect this to happen, right? We would expect the rates to fall off and, and, and things to be tough. But in most of the sectors, they've actually performed pretty well. Uh, the stock valuations as a result are near all-time record lows. Uh, you know, investing you obviously you want to buy low and sell high but the problem is when stocks are low everyone's mad and pissed off and upset and tired and bored and nobody wants to buy the stuff and, and then when things are running and they're high like maybe they were last december uh you know business is booming right i got folks busting down the door to to work with our research and now it's like you know sometimes it's like speaking to an empty room i, I don't know how many folks are on here today but i imagine shipping was not the most exciting topic at the at the money expo and that's fine um, but that's the way things are in this sector only two out of 55 maritime shipping companies are positive year to date. One of those is up by like 2% and the other one's up by like 30%. And it's kind of a niche situation, very small cap. It's like $40 million. Uh, every other 53 companies out of 55 are down. Most of them are down somewhere between 30 and 70% down year to date. So very brutal sector. Um, words, you know, sometimes don't show it. So here is a chart showing the performance. Uh, the yellow at the top is the NASDAQ, of course. It is positive year to date, surprisingly. It's right, it's up almost 20% year to date. Uh, the Russell is still down a little bit, about 11% year to date. And the blue line is our shipping index. Now that's a proprietary product. We have a value investor's edge, but that's basically the average of about 55 shipping companies. Um, so you can see there. And then to make things more explicit for you, in Q1, you can see the NASDAQ's down about 25% off COVID. Russell's down about 35% and shipping stocks are down about 50% through Q1. Now, Q1, I'm sitting here into March and I'm saying, well, this is painful, but this makes sense, right? I understand this. This is not that baffling, right? I mean, tech stocks are going to hold up better in a global pandemic. Uh, small caps are going to hit a little bit harder and shipping is like the riskiest sector, right? I totally get that. Totally makes sense. Nothing wrong with Q1 performance. Markets functioning as a market should. No complaints. Now look at this. April to July, recovery, people's enthusiasm comes up, money flows into the stock market, risk starts coming on, the Fed is printing money left and right, and the NASDAQ just explodes. It's up 55%. The Russell, right, full of all sorts of risky small cap stocks, 45% up, and shipping stocks completely flat. Didn't move a muscle. Stocks have not moved in four months. And that is incredibly frustrating for folks, but therein lies the opportunity, right? Everything else has ran away and this value is still sitting here. So why have these stocks lagged? So I think Q1 is sort of self-explanatory, right? But the question is April, May, June, July, like what the heck is going on here? So first of all, a very bad sector and style screen, right? There's so much passive money in the market today. There's so many just day trading slash Robin Hood. And, and then of course, all these institutionals are all in like passive ETFs and sectors and themes, right? So shipping falls into five categories that have just been hated in 2020 and shipping owns all five of them. So first of all, value. Value stocks have underperformed for the last 20 years. Uh, it's been a very brutal trend for anything value related. Small cap. Small cap stocks have underperformed in the last decade. Uh, they, they, did, they had a couple of good years in there, but for the most part, small cap stocks have been laggards. International stocks have been laggards, especially during COVID. Uh, they don't have the same confidence and same enthusiasm that U.S. stocks have had throughout this year. Fourthly, commodity stocks. Now we've gotten a little bit more interest in gold and silver recently, but commodity stocks have severely lagged the sector. Finally, higher leverage. The market does not want to mess with stocks with high leverage. Oh, six things. Yeah, you know, I said five, it was six. China exposure, right? Nothing associated with China and China is the driving force of a lot of global trade. Most shipping investors are also deep value orientated. And if you're deep value orientated, you're probably the kind of guy and I was, I did some of this myself. You took a lot of cash off when COVID started. You, you wondered why, you know, the market wasn't responding. Then the market responded and you were like, I was right. I'm smart. And then the market kind of took off and you're sitting there saying, this is crazy. So deep value guys aren't really loving this market. They think there's going to be an enormous crash coming around the corner. And those are the kind of people that buy shipping stocks. So just another whammy uh, for the supply and demand of shares. And then finally, there's been a challenging history of sector returns and governance. That's true of a lot of small cap stocks. That's not really a shipping specific thing. 
shipping takes a lot of flack, uh, but mining, small cap energy, there's hundreds of, of boom and bust stories in all those sectors as well. But shipping does suffer from that, and that is a drag on attracting new investors sometimes. Will this change? Because if it's not going to change, then what are we doing here? Why are we waste our time? You know, I've been here 11 years covering the sector, and it always goes through these waves. And this feels a lot like it did in early 16 when people were cursing off the shipping sector. In the next couple of years, we're, we're brilliant for us. So let, let's hope it changes again. I, there's three reasons why I think it's going to change going forward. First of all, value investors are going to come back to the market. Uh, shipping firms have the strongest value proposition of any sector in the market. I challenge anyone to, to show me a sector that has cheaper valuations and a more promising growth trajectory for the valuations, right? Not compared to like Tesla or Bitcoin or something, but show me another value sector like energy or mining that has anything near the valuations and prospects of shipping. You can't find it. I, I, I guarantee it. Finally, uh, again, very promising setup. Secondly, uh, many of these firms are actually earning very strong cash flows, but that's being overshadowed because COVID is such a just overall weight anvil on this sector. The balance sheets are the strongest shipping firms have had in decades. These aren't the shipping firms from 2008 and 2009 that went bankrupt, right? These firms are doing really well. And then finally, once COVID-19 is cleared, I expect dividends and repurchases to come back. We've actually had kind of a negative wave the last uh, few months with dividends being cut or suspended or paused. And, you know, at one hand, that makes sense because it's, it's uncertain, right? The market's crazy. But on the other hand, investors are kind of fed up, right? They've been taking blows left and right. The last thing they need for sentiment is dividend cuts, and that's been happening. And then finally, inflation trades are gaining big time steam, right? Gold, silver, gold miners, stuff like GLD, GDX, SLV, right? It's gaining a lot of steam. Even crypto is getting in on that bandwagon. Shipping is probably, I don't know if it's the best inflation hedge, but it's one of the best out there. First of all, rates and vessel valuations, the values of those ships are going to go up in an inflationary environment. The debt, does not. It stays flat, right? So these firms with higher leverage, the value of their debt goes down, the value of their assets and earnings potential go up. You're going to see astronomical gains, just exponential gains in net asset value and earnings per share if we have like a hyperinflationary environment. I don't personally buy that we're going to have like a hyperinflationary environment, but a lot of folks do. And that's what that's what's behind the whole GLD and, and silver trades. And if you like that kind of stuff, then shipping is one of the best spots to be. So with that said, back to the five themes we're going to cover. We're going to run through each of these in a couple of minutes, five sectors. So starting off with container ships, container ships are like retail goods, anything that you can fit in one of those boxes that you see like on the trains, on the trucks, these fit on these, these ships and these ships hold five, 10, some of them even hold 20,000 boxes. So massive, massive ships. Um, this segment bottomed out big time in May with COVID. It was kind of delayed. It held up strong in January and February and then just kind of bottomed out hard in, in April and May. But now the charter rates have recovered for eight weeks straight. Every week, every Friday, I'll, I pull up the latest rates and they're higher and higher and higher. And last Friday's gain was one of the biggest gains I've ever seen in terms of percentage week over week. Uh, average container ship rates are actually above the five-year average. So this market is not uh, depressed. It's doing quite well, actually. Supply balance is limited. There's only about 10% left on the order book, and that's only for very large containers. It's not for the more mid-sized and smaller coastal and, and regional trades. And demolition levels are increasing. So when containers can, uh, container ships can't find employment, they just demolish them. So there's a lot less competitive pressure in the future. And finally, global container lines, they've rationalized the supply. They have almost like an oligopoly control over this market. In fact, they're actually being investigated, a couple of them for collusion, of how well they've controlled this market even during COVID. So I'm going I'm to show you our top trade here and, and run through some charts. So our top pick in containers is going to be global ship lease, stock symbol GSL. I'm also long this company. That's our favorite name in the sector. We believe it's somewhere between a 2x and a 3x if these trade potentials and investor interests start coming back to the market. Some of the other firms are listed below, Capital Product, Costa Marie, Deneos, and Navios Containers. I may be long uh, some of those as well, but uh, Global Ship Lease is our, is our topic there. Uh, as I mentioned, it's an oligopoly market. Uh, you can see right here, the top five container lines control 64% of this market, 82% of the top 10. Counterparty and exposure risk is that number one factor to watch. But all these companies are actually generating very strong profits in 2020. They've done an excellent job of controlling the market. Meanwhile, they got their hands out for government stimulus. Oh, COVID-19, help us. And they're all getting government loans. So these container liners are living fat off the hog. 2020 might be one of the best years they've had in a decade. It's just absolutely topsy-turvy market out there. So this is a five-year chart of rates. You can see that we've we bottomed out in May, like I mentioned, and we are now above the five-year average. Now, if it's a week or five years, true, but it, we are above that five-year average. And then the one-year chart, you can really see it there. It bottomed out and is, is rapidly recovering. Uh, this trajectory in about a month will be back to the yearly average. 2019 was a very strong year for container ships. So we're, we're coming back up on that one year. 
Secondly, dry bulk. So this is like iron ore, coal, uh, forestry products, stuff like that. Uh, this is a pure bet on China. So it's risky. If you don't like China, you probably stare away, probably tune me out for a couple of minutes here. Uh, the Cape size market specifically, the largest bulk ships, 180,000 tons of capacity. It's hard for the human brain to comprehend that amount of iron ore and coal and just sitting there in a boat, but it's a lot, right? Uh, think of like a skyscraper tilted over sideways and floating across the ocean. So these are massive ships. Um, this is this market is completely dependent really on Brazil to China iron ore. Traditionally, uh, China's got a lot of their iron ore from Australia. It makes sense. Ch uh, Australia had a lot of iron ore. It was cheap. It was close to China, not too far away. Brazil is three times further away, but the iron ore is way cheaper. Also, uh, China and Australia, if you're into geopolitics, they've been having kind of a tiff back and forth about this, the whole COVID thing and the whole, there's sort of like that same tension level. Uh, so China is threatening to move away from Australia at an accelerated pace. They're already kind of doing it, but now they're threatening to accelerate it. That means more flows out of Brazil, which is three times further than Australia. So every boatload, three times better. Uh, Valet has missed their targets year after year after year. But a lot of times they've had good reasons. So 2019, they had this massive tailing dam collapse. If you follow the shipping sector, that was international news for like two weeks. Uh, if not, just Google Valley Dam Collapse and you can see YouTube videos of it. it was nasty, nasty pollution, contamination, lawsuits, all sorts of stuff. That was 2019. They've moved past that now, recovered from that. 2020, COVID. So left hook, right hook, right? Double, double hit to the sector. Now they've reiterated just about 10 days ago, reiterated their second half guidelines or targets for exports. I am skeptical that they can hit those those export targets because they're so massive. Uh, but if they do hit them, those Cape size rates are going to shoot up big time, uh, starting here in August and probably through November, December. So top pick and dry bulk. I like corporate governance here. I like a solid balance sheet. And I like a blended uh, fleet profile. So I prefer star bulk carriers, stock symbol SBLK. I am long there as well. Uh, here's some other firms in the sector, uh, stuff uh, listed there. And as you can see, and I kind of mentioned, dry bulk rates are violently seasonal. So every summer they spike up and then like every winter they kind of spike up and then they have these doldrums into the February, March, April kind of timeframe. So what we saw with COVID was a little bit accelerated, exaggerated, but it, it was fairly normal. I mean, if you look at this chart, 2020 doesn't stick out that much. It looks pretty normal. Now we can see August kind of hooked up rates a little bit. Will it keep going up? Uh, if Valley sticks to those targets, I bet it will. And here's kind of the, uh, I don't know if my video blocks all this out, but you can see the, the yearly chart there. The, the really bad trough in March and April and a nice recovery into June and July there. Next, LPG, I uh, think like propane, right? Liquefied propane. So this is an unappreciated cash flow machine. This market is going bonkers and the market is ignoring it, doesn't care about it. Uh, VLGC rates, very large gas carriers, the largest uh, class of this vessel. The rates have been soaring for three weeks straight, actually make it four weeks. I made, I made this slide last week, so four weeks. The latest print was $55,000 a day last Friday. Um, a normal rate is 25, maybe 30. So 55 is double the rates. And keep in mind, it, with shipping, all the costs are fixed. So when your rate doubles, your profit actually goes up like five, six, seven times. So it's, it's a very, very uh, operationally leveraged market, which is one of the reasons we love it. Uh, all the stocks, they just haven't moved. Like everyone's just like blindfolded on and doesn't care about the rates. Dorian, which I guess I just gave away the top pick, they're going to report earnings tomorrow morning. So you can tune in there, see how they do, see what their guidance is, see what their commentary is. They have a repurchase program that they they used heavily last year, uh, but they, they kind of chickened out over the summer, right? There's a lot of COVID uncertainty. There was, the rates had dipped temporarily, right? So they, they did the responsible thing and they stopped repurchases. Uh, but now with rates going gangbusters again and the stock just trading in the toilet, I think they're going to start the repurchase on Thursday. Uh, if anything, for traders, this is amazing stock here. Dorian LPG, highest possible conviction. I'm, I am long the stock, of course. Um, I really like that one. I think, that has, I think it's good trade, and I think it's also a good longer-term investment. As I mentioned, rates have massive recovered. You saw COVID, right? COVID was a real thing. It came in and hit the rates, but it lasted for a couple months. Rates are right back up. Meanwhile, here's the stock. I, it just went on snooze. Right? Like people sold it off for COVID and the stock just sits there. Like nobody buys it. It's flat. Uh, meanwhile, they're generating enormous amounts of cash flow. They trade it like two times free cash flow. So every year you make 50% of the market cap back in free cash. So it's a pretty incredible stock at, at this price. LNG. Let's talk about that one. So LNG is probably the biggest long-term growth story. We're talking like 5, 10, maybe even 20 years of growth. So liquefied natural gas, right? Taking a lot of that cheap U.S. shale gas, liquefying it and seeing it over to places like Asia, uh, China, India, South Korea, Japan, places that don't have their own gas supply, but want to move away from that dirtier, nastier coal, right? Coal is, is dying very rapidly and LNG is replacing it. So we had very optimistic prospects for the sector just a year or two ago. 
but COVID hit us and we had two back-to-back -back very warm winters in Asia. And if you think about the United States and what we use gas for, we're a very developed country, right? So we use natural gas for some transportation, for a lot of power generation, for heating, sure, but also for your, your clothes dryer, for your gas stove, right? It's not just for heating your house. Well, over in Asia, they're not quite so advanced, so they only really use it for heating. So it's a very seasonal market. So whenever the winter comes up that, you know, the demand spikes, but there's not like that base load that keeps the demand steady throughout the year. So if you have a warm winter and you're selling LNG, you're kind of screwed, right? So that's what kind of happened to us the last two years. Now, China is rapidly modernizing. They love LNG. They can't get enough of it. They're transforming their diesel trucks over to LNG. They're installing new uh, LNG uh, gas powered power plants. So this is a multi-decade growth story, right? It's not just like a year or two here. Um, LNG pricing has been very depressed during 2020, obviously. I mean, we're in like a, a mini global recession right now. So the demand force went down. Meanwhile, the winter was very warm. Uh, so the demand went, a lot, went, went very down seasonally, right? But it's already starting to recover into the summer. And we expect the normal winter boost to come in big time this upcoming winter. So our top pick in LNG, we like the firm that has the newest, most modern ships and has a solid government management team. That's Flex LNG, stock symbol FLNG. They have the newest, most modern fleet on the market. They actually have six more new ships delivering uh, between later this year and early next year. Some other firms you might've heard of or might be interested in are Gaslog, Gaslog Partners, Golar LNG and TK LNG Partners. I am long Flex as well. Uh, so U.S. is driving this trade. I, I mentioned how the how the Permian and then some of those other gas sources are driving the exports. Uh, they we didn't really start exporting LNG in the United States until 2016. It's a more recent story, but the U.S. is the largest source of potential future growth. Um, there's also Qatar is another major uh, source of growth. Uh, the U.S. is heading towards the second largest global exporter by mid 2020s. Now that's an ambitious target. Uh, but it seems realistic. Um, I think Qatar is probably going to maintain that number one spot, but U.S. has a chance to be number two. And eventually, I say potential, question mark, I don't know. That's speculative, but 2030, 2040, 2050, right? This is a multi-decade story. Uh, the U.S. has an unsurpassed level of natural gas reserves. So temporary COVID-19 delays have slowed down exports, have hurt the near-term pricing market, and have kind of put a pause on things here. So here's the chart. It, this is from the Energy Infra Information Administration. You can see starting in, you know, starting in 2005, we started getting a little bit of exports here, right? Up to about 2015. Then it was just a rocket, absolute rocket of 2020. But you can see there's just kind of a fallback here. And that's because of a lot of the pricing dislocations, right? If the pricing is dirt cheap and the demand is low, you're not going to take that gas and ship it all the way from like Louisiana over to China. You're just not going to ship it. So that's kind of what's happened over the last couple of months. We've had more gas go into storage or diverted to other areas. Uh, starting this summer into this fall, I expect that to spike right back up and we should be setting all new highs by December, January. So also markets are very seasonal. Here's a, here's a chart from our service that shows that. Uh, you can see in, in late 18 and early 19, just a massive, beautiful spike on rates. And then of course, again, in 2020, not quite as strong. Both of these, remember, were warm winters. If they were colder winters, this would be more of a normal looking parabola, normal looking parabola. That's what we'd expect to see. That's kind of what this market looked like, right? It was like a parabola. Um, here we are, and again, in the summer doldrums, we expect that will rise up again into the winter. And we can already see that developing in the futures market. This is the JKM Asian futures for LNG. And we can see that there's a huge contango developing from September through December, January, and February. Finally, crew tankers, long-term supply setup. These have kind of been a weird sort of battleground stock of the last couple months, especially on Twitter and other places. Uh, folks got really excited about the floating storage play. And hey, it was a great play for two months, three months, but it was short-lived, right? And then a lot of hedge funds and other companies came in and shorted the hell out of these stocks. And it's just been a battleground space, really weird. Uh, but crew tankers have the lowest order book in over 30 years, which is the supply side of the picture, right? They also have the oldest fleet balance they've ever had in history into significant regulatory changes. So we had IMO 2020, which was a big emissions regulation that drives up the operating costs of older ships. And we also had a ballast water treatment requirement that also drives up the maintenance costs for older ships. So two things that if you have these two regulations and weak rates, you're gonna shove these old ships out the door and demolish them. Once the rates are bad, we got dozens, if not hundreds of ships that could leave the fleet over the coming two to three years. Meanwhile, the long-term demand store is really good. We have US and Brazil are exporting crude oil to Asian customers. So think China, South Korea, India, and so on. That's two to three times the distance. Shipping is all about distance. 
it's not about volumes. It's about ton miles. So volume times distance, right? So you can have a flat global economy or flat global consumption, but if your, you know, importers and exporters are getting further and further and further apart, you know, your rates can skyrocket. So there's this misconception that it's linked to GDP. In, in the long run, yeah, you want growing GDP, that's obvious. But in the short term, you're looking for these dislocations and trade patterns, and you can get those without a huge growth in global demand. So COVID-19, again, totally distorted market, turning into this weird battleground situation. We expect the markets will be totally normalized by mid-21. Meanwhile, the valuations of these companies sit at record lows. Our top pick in crew tankers, governance all the way, strong fleet, strong balance sheet is Euronav, and then a couple other companies down there, DHT, Diamond S, International Seaways, and TK Tankers. Uh, I'm actually long uh, four out of five of those names, including Euronav, so very uh, firm belief in, in the values of the sector. Um, here, here again, is kind of what I showed you. This is from Euronav, our, our top pick. I kind of just stole this slide for them. But you can see how kind of these are the aging ships. So each quarter, starting in Q220, which is just ended, and Q320, which is now, you can see all these ships that are entering dry docks. So the, the thesis is that if rates are weak, though especially the ones coming in 25, 22 and a half, 20, they're just going to be demolished and hauled right off the fleet. So very promising fleet dynamics. And second of all, this is the demand picture we talked about. Basically, all the future demand is from Asia. And all the future supply is from west of the Suez Max, either Western Africa, Nigeria, Brazil, or U.S. Gulf. So everything demand-wise is from the east, and everything uh, supply-wise is from the west. So huge, huge growth in uh, ton lines. So recap real quick for you. Container ships, global recovery setup. We like global ship lease, GSL. Dry bulk, bet on that China stimulus. We like star bulk carriers. If you don't believe in China, don't buy that stock. LPG, unappreciated cash flow machine, buy that Dorian stock. LNG, secular growth and a seasonal boost, buy flex LNG. And crude tankers, long-term supply setup. We believe in it, buy Euronav. I realize I ran about five minutes long, so it means probably about five minutes for questions. Uh, the offer still stands. Uh, if you can't answer it here, tweet at me or preferably get on Value Investors Edge hit up a two-week free trial and uh, work with our platform and ask all the questions you want. I'll be happy to answer them. All right. With that said, we got some time for questions. I'll pull up the chat box here and see if there's anything available. Thanks, Jay. That was, that was a really nice presentation. Uh, first question we have here is, why do you dislike Sting, Scorpio tankers on Twitter? <laughs> all right. So we're doing some rivalry here. So Scorpio tankers is the largest product tanker company. So your was the largest crude tanker one. Uh, Scorpio tankers is the largest product tanker. It's not so much that I dislike them personally, like I have a grudge on them or anything. Um, but there's two problems. Number one, their leverage is very high. And now leverage itself isn't the problem. It's the maturities and the amortization schedule. So Scorpio tankers has a lot of debt amortization due uh, between now, which is Q3 20 through 2022. In fact, early 22, they have a huge chunk of convertible bonds that are due. Uh, so that's a risk factor. Their leverage is higher than we'd like. And then secondly, there's been a lot of shenanigans around the stock. Uh, Scorpio Bulkers, their kind of sister company, did a big dilution. Uh, their CEO does a lot of options trading, things that are distracting. Uh, we prefer companies that are just laser focused on operations, and uh, Euronav in the crude tanker space would be one of those. Thank you. What do you think about OSG? Uh, we're interested in the recent purchases that have left yet another left another transportation company owning more than twenty percent of the OSG. OSG. I'm glad someone brought that up. Earlier, I mentioned, I think I said two companies were positive year over year. And I said one was up like 20, 30%, very niche. One was up like maybe like 5%. That second one that was up like 5% is OSG. So it's the second best performer out of 55 maritime shipping companies. Uh, we believe that's a potential takeover candidate. I believe a fair value for that is somewhere between uh, probably about 450 and six bucks a share. Uh, takeover probably a little lower, uh, probably about probably four to five dollars. Uh, there's a small company called Salt Shuck. Uh, acquisition that's or resources that's been messing around with it a little bit. Uh, they're over 10% owner at this point. They've been buying shares on the open market. OSG is Jones Act. So it's US protected. It's not part of those overall global international trades. So they've actually been very protected. Um, yet, if you look at the stock symbol over the last four or five years, it just correlates with every other shipping company. So first of all, we thought that correlation was wrong, hence why we were bullish. Uh, secondly, we believe it's an acquisition target. And as proof of that, there's a major uh, small private com or a major private company in the Northwest United States, Saltrick Resources, which has recently been adding shares. Thank you. Which fleet class of tankers do you prefer? I assume VLCC or do you prefer, say, clean rather than dirty? 
that's a, that's a good question as well. So uh, crude versus uh, clean uh, or, or clean versus dirty. Clean would be fine products for those that maybe don't know. It's like diesel, gasoline, dirty is just crude oil. Uh, those correlate pretty closely. So it's not a whole lot where you say, I love this half and I hate that half. I think both the, uh, the supply pictures are very good. I think the demand pictures are also promising. However, crude is a little bit easier to slice and dice when it comes to supply and demand. Crude, I ran through it with the slides, right? It was very clear. Product is a little bit tricky here because the MRs, the medium sized, have a larger order book than most of the other classes. The orders seem to keep flowing in for new ships, and we're not quite sure how the global destocking is going to run uh, for refined products. Uh, it's a little bit more challenging. If you look back to 2016, 2017, there was two very brutal years when we had a destocking off that big, remember that big crash in 15 and 16 when oil came down? It took a couple of years for that to run off. So I'm a little bit more cautious on product tankers. I do prefer crude, specifically in crude, good question as well. Uh, VLCCs are solid. I also like Suez Maxis. So my, my top pick is Euronav, but I also like a company called uh, TK Tankers and another company called Diamond S. Both of those have a lot of Suez Maxis. Ship, shipbuilding has been very poor. Will China or someone else stimulate their shipbuilders through massive subsidies? Good question. And that is probably the number one risk, right, to the supply side of the equation is are we going to have just a massive raft of new ships coming into the market? If we look back at history and, and see last time that happened, the first massive raft of ships we had was between like 2005 and 2008 was when the market was booming. Rates were at all time highs and everyone was chasing it. So it's very like market driven, right? That's kind of normal. The second raft of deliveries we had was from about 2012 to 2014, 15. That was kind of the second big chunk we had. That was driven heavily, heavily by private equity dumping their money into the market saying it's a it's a turnaround global uplift trade and it was but they screwed themselves they ordered so many ships that they oversupplied both the bulk and the tanker sectors is it a risk yes it is absolutely a risk which is why we monitor the new building activity on a weekly basis uh, we cover that in all of our reports and if you read any of the reports by my macro guy james catlin every single one will outline the entire order book and everything all the new orders we've seen the trends and, and so on so thanks for asking absolutely you need to pay attention to that all right, thanks. We have time for one more question here. Scrapping has been absolutely horrible due to low scrap iron rates. What do you foresee going forward for, say, tankers? Yeah, so, well, first of all, scrapping levels have been low heavily because all, this, all the dry docks, all the places where they would scrap these places, are mostly Indian subcontinent. So think India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, a lot of these countries were very hard hit by COVID. They still are being hard hit by COVID. A lot of them just outright closed the beaches, the scrapping beaches, right? So there wasn't really any scrapping activity from like middle of February through like June. June is kind of, May and June is when it just started creeping back up. We had a big resurgence in scrapping in June and July. Now to tankers more specifically, you gotta, you gotta remember that these, this scrapping is only gonna happen with, with two things. First of all, they have to come up for survey or dry dock. There's got to be a reason that you're, you're asking yourself this question, right? Should I scrap the ship? So you have to have the surveys and dry docks. In COVID-19, everyone got a three-month extension on their surveys and dry docks. So that was another shift to the right on scrapping. Secondly, the rates have to be so bad that it doesn't make sense to keep the ship. So you need to have the surveys, which are just now coming up. Good question. It's, they just started in July and they're, they're receding normally now. The beaches are open and you have to have low rates, which we're starting to see in tankers. So I think if you go forward, I think in the second half of 2020, over the first half of 2020, you'll have at least three to four times the volumes of, of ships being demolished. And as we head into 21 and that market gets more normalized, I think we'll see a normal economic reaction that if rates are low, then you'll see a lot of ships getting scrapped. As far as scrap iron prices, they did dip with COVID-19, but they're resurging rapidly. And I expect those scrap prices to recover in the next few months, especially if China keeps up that stimulus. Thank you, Jay. We really appreciate you being here today. It was a great presentation. Thank you very much, everyone. Appreciate your time. Follow me on Twitter and uh, check out their research trial. And thanks again for everyone else who joined us as well. As a friendly reminder, if you miss a session or would like to replay sessions on demand, you can do so by visiting virtualpass.moneyshow.com. Your virtual pass includes video and audio recordings of 30 plus hours of timely presentations from this week's virtual event, plus information packed slide presentations from our speakers.